roller coaster. So you get 30 seconds of weightlessness where you're literally floating the plane. And, you know, here's a picture. Uh, one of my Russian instructors is holding me over his head, and he's going to throw me just like a missile uh, to the other end. And here you see someone catching me at, at the other end, just as the plane is coming up when, you know, you fall to the ground or somebody doesn't grab you. But this is to get you conditioned for uh, being weightless. And uh, I did three trips like this, and I thought it was pretty good preparation. You can do this uh, not only in Russia, but I think in uh, Kennedy, down around Kennedy Space Center, and also out in California, for like $5,000, it'll take you up. How much time to pull Pardon me? How much time to pull Oh, very good. Uh, you know, when it's, fortunately, I didn't get motion sickness, but uh, about half the people that go into space do get motion sickness. Some on this, and some who go through this still you know, get sick up in space because it's, it's a different sort of thing than your uh, vestibular uh, system. This is what 20 million horsepower looks like. That, that's about the peak power developed by the Soyuz rocket. Um, the white part is a shroud that covers the Soyuz that we fly in. Everything in gray is the rocket, which is jet fuel or kerosene and, and liquid oxygen. That, that gets filled uh, at the launch pad. Another thing that impressed me about the Russian Space Agency is they make great use of existing resources. And I mean, I, you know, a lot of things about business ran true here. Um, you know, until recently, they just didn't have a lot of money, especially six, eight years ago. So they had to make do. You know, they couldn't buy new equipment. They had to use the old stuff. Happens a lot in the laboratory. Um, Soyuz has been flying for about 45 years now. It's been heavily modified and evolved, but you know that's not all that much different from the vehicle Yuri Gagarin flew in. He was the first human being who orbited the Earth in 1961. And this is mounted on an ordinary railroad track, and it's pulled out by a freight locomotive. No special tractors or anything. And when the locomotive is done pulling it out to the launch pad, it, it goes back to pulling freight in the railroad yard. So, <laughs> listen, it works. They, they've done over a thousand of these things, you know, quite successfully. So it impressed me that they had a, a great use of resources. Again, it rang true with you know, starting and running businesses. This is a picture of us inside the Soyuz capsule. You can see it's very uh, crowded and cramped. It's you know, roughly the diameter of one of these tables here. Uh, this is me, this is uh, Tokarev, and this is Bill MacArthur. Uh, looks just like a, uh, the hatch on a vacuum system, double O-ring seal. The way we leak check it, it's the same way you do in a lab. You pull a vacuum on it, and you record the pressure as a function of time, and you know, if the leak rate is small enough, it passes. So that's the, uh, that's the way you do that. We have to stay in this position for two and a half hours before launch, and then about four and a half hours after launch. And I, I'm not ashamed to say we all wore huggy diapers, and we all used them, because there's no facility in this part of this sort of use. <coughs> Let's see what's next. Here's the actual launch. This is October 1st of last year. And I, we don't have the sound, unfortunately. Quite a feeling going up. I mean, that's all you know, the acceleration itself is increasing. We got up to about three and a half G's, three and a half times gravity on there, but otherwise the launch was pretty smooth. Uh, it only took us 10 minutes to get into orbit. And the way I knew that was when we were in this position, I tried to lift my arm and it felt like I had a 10 pound weight sitting on it. It was hard to lift my arm. And then after about nine and a half minutes, it just kind of floated like that. Now the station's only 200 miles away, but it took us two days to reach it. And the reason is you have to make about 35 orbits to slowly approach the station and get just the right velocity and, and height. You know, the station's traveling at about 17,500 miles an hour. Right? It's five miles every second. So you know, you've got 
to be careful that you don't impact it the wrong way. So you know uh, that drug case against Yao guy? Yeah, I'll show you that funny thing you should ask. This is a picture of me about four hours after launch when we uh, leak checked everything and then we're able to open our visors and <coughs> take the gloves off. Yeah, I had a window and that was one of the most interesting things for me. Now you saw that white shroud around the vehicle. So when we launched, we couldn't see anything outside. Uh, and the purpose of that shroud is to protect the antenna and other things from, you know, the atmosphere is gaining velocity. Uh, but at about 50 miles, the air is thin enough that they jettison the shroud. So I heard this explosion, went boom. I see something go flying out. I look at, out the window and I see this white thing flying away. And I look down and I see this big blue sphere just slowly receding. It's just a fabulous sight. Um, I brought a Sony uh, PD-150 uh, video camera up. Uh, there's lots of video and uh, camera uh, photo equipment on the station. The video is mostly PAL and C-CAM, so I didn't want to go through that whole translation thing. So uh, I brought the camera and left it up there. I, I, I took the tapes back with me. <coughs> Yeah. You showed the vehicle the launch vehicle. Uh, no, that was uh, the launch vehicle. That was very foreshortened by the uh, by a telephoto lens. Um, the actual vehicle is about it's, it's about it's over 200 feet high. Uh, yeah. Here's um. Let's, let's go back. Take a look. Let's see. Um, Another thing, can you imagine people getting that close to a shuttle two hmm. days before launch? And my friends and family were over for the launch. And they could all they literally go up and touch the rocket. Uh, they just have a much more relaxed, everyday business attitude towards launching these things. And <coughs> listen, it works. Here's the view outside the station. This is us as we're docking. Remember, 17,500 miles an hour we're doing this. This docking was completely automated. That's not always the case, but uh, for us it was. Um, if it wasn't, you know, there are several, uh, there are usually about three levels of redundancy on everything. And if if we were not able to dock automatically, if we were totally uh, manual, we had to use a laser rangefinder. And someone would get up by one of the windows and you know, look out at the uh, station. You have to find two things. Uh, what's the distance, obviously, and also what's the speed of approach. So part of our training was in optics, how to use a laser rangefinder. You're in the sphere there? Sorry? You're inside the sphere? Uh, actually, at this stage, we're back in the uh, descent module. Uh, but this is called the habitat module. And uh, that's where we go up to the habitat, if you like. Uh, but this is the that hatch you saw. There's one right here. We have a hatch, and the station has a hatch. And after we dock, the first thing we do is leak check both hatches. And then when we both sign off that our, our hatches are leak tight. We can open them. One of the minor, I don't know if you call it a glitch, it took us five minutes to open the hatch. Uh, literally, it took the three of us grabbing on with our feet against the wall, pulling for five minutes. Uh, and the thoughts running through my head, well, does it work? And now we can't open the door. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did get it open eventually. Um, here's a picture of me right after uh, we came through. and. When people ask me, what was your favorite thing up there? Uh, I mean, that was it. It's, it's, it's like magic floating in space. I, I used to teach physics and, you know, about mass, momentum, and inertia, but to actually be the experiment is just mind-boggling. 